Welcome, everyone. My name is Lekha Jeevan. I'm a software developer in test with Rackspace. And uh, I'm Glyph, also a software developer at Rackspace. Today, Glyph and I are here to talk to you all about Mimic, an open source framework that allows for testing of OpenStack as well as Rackspace APIs. Mimic has been making testing across products in Rackspace a cakewalk, and we think it could potentially do the same for OpenStack-based applications as well someday. Today, we're not there yet, and your contributions will help us get there soon. I originally created Mimic to help with testing Rackspace Autoscale because I hate waiting for tests to run. Also, I was creating it, as I was creating it, I realized that it could be something that could be reused for multiple projects across Rackspace and OpenStack. And Glyph volunteered to help achieve that. Uh, I saw Mimic had a lot of promise, but uh, needed some help with its implementation. So I came onto the project, and I've been helping improve its architecture, uh, making it more generic and modular. So before we even begin to dive into the details, let's take a quick sneak peek at what Mimic does and how easy it is to get started with it. So in a virtual end, we pip install Mimic, run Mimic, and hit the endpoint. And Mimic returns the authentication endpoint to be able to authenticate and get the service catalog of all the services that Mimic implements. While today Mimic is for general purpose testing, it was originally created for Rackspace Autoscale. So let's talk about that and see why we needed Mimic. So Rackspace Autoscale is an open source project, a solution that Rackspace utilizes to automate the process of getting the right amount of compute capacity for an application by creating or deleting servers that is scaling up or scaling down servers and associating them with load balancers. In order to perform these tasks, Autoscale depended upon three backend Rackspace APIs. One was the Rackspace identity for authentication and impersonation, cloud servers for provisioning and deleting servers, and load balancers for adding and removing servers from the load balancers as they were created and or deleted. Rackspace identity is API compatible with OpenStack identity v2, and Rackspace cloud servers is powered by OpenStack compute. Rackspace cloud load balancers is a custom API. As Autoscale was interacting with so many other systems, testing Autoscale did not mean just testing features of Autoscale, but also that all the systems that Autoscale depended on, if any of them did not behave as expected, Autoscale did not crumble and crash, but was consistent and able to handle these errors gracefully. So there were two kinds of tests for Autoscale. One was the functional test that validated the API contracts. These tests verified that the Autoscale API responded accurately for given valid or malformed requests. And the other was the system integration test. These were more complex tests. These verified the integration between Autoscale and identity, compute, and load balancers. For example, when a scaling group is created, one, one such test would verify that the server on that scaling group is provisioned successfully. That is, that the server not only went into an active state, but also was added as a node to the load balancer. Or if one of those servers went into an error state, then that autoscale was able to reprovision that server successfully and then add it to the load balancer in the scaling group. So all these tests were set up to run against our production environment. And here are some observations I had whilst writing these tests. Servers could take a while to build, sometimes five minutes, sometimes 10 minutes, or longer. And the test would run that much longer. And sometimes tests would just fail randomly, because a test was expecting a server to go from build state to an active state. But the server would go into an error state. And tests for such negative scenarios, like actually testing how autoscale would behave if a, test, a server did go into an error state, could not be tested, because it was not reproducible consistently. However, the overall test coverage was improving, and I continued to add tests, oblivious of the time it would take to run the entire test suite. And later, we even added these tests as a gate for Autoscale's merge pipeline. And things were not going so well, because tests were slow and flaky, and nobody wanted to run these tests locally, because not even me when I was adding more tests. And our peers from compute and load balancers were not happy, because we were using all of their resources for our auto-scale testing. And they were so not happy that we were pretty glad we were in a remote office. <laughs> but 
We had had enough. This had to change. We needed something to save us from these slow, flaky tests. So now that we've had enough, how are we going to solve this problem? Since we've been proceeding from the specific case of autoscale to the general utility of Mimic, let's go back to the general problem of testing for failure and proceed to the specific benefits that Mimic uh, provides. When you have code that handles failures, you need to have tests and ensure that that code works properly. Uh, and if you have code that talks to external services, those services are going to fail. And you're going to need to handle when that failure happens. You're going to need to have code for that. But if your only integration tests are against real versions of these external services, then only your unit tests are going to give you any idea whether you've handled those failure cases correctly. Uh, your positive path code, the code that uh, submits a request and gets the response that it expects, is going to get lots of testing in the real world. Uh, services usually work, and when they don't, the whole business of service providers is to fix it so that they do work. Uh, so most likely, your positive path code is going to get exercised all the time. You'll have plenty of opportunities to flush out those bugs. If you test against real services, though, your negative path code will only get invoked in production when there's a real error. If everything's going as planned, this should be infrequent, which is great for your real service, but terrible for your test coverage. It's really important to get negative path code right, if, because if all the external services you rely on are working fine, then it's probably OK if your code has a couple of bugs. You can work around them manually. But if things are starting to fail with some regularity in your cloud, and that is to say if you are using a cloud, uh, you, uh, that, that is exactly when you need to make sure that your system is behaving correctly, accurately reporting those errors, measuring those statistics on those errors, and allowing you to stay on top of incident management for your service and your cloud, and take advantage of those nice SLAs that your provider gives you. Uh, even worse, when you're testing against a real service, you're probably testing against a staging instance because you don't want to disturb production with all your testing. And if your staging instance is typical, then it doesn't have as much hardware, it doesn't have as many users, it doesn't have as much networking gear as your production environment. And every additional piece of hardware or concurrent user or network partition is an additional opportunity for failure. So that means your staging environment is even less likely to fail. I remember the bad old days of the 1990s when most projects didn't even have unit tests. Uh, things are better than that now. OpenStack itself has great coverage. We have unit tests for uh, individual units and integration tests for testing components together. It's a marvelous future we're all in today. Um, and we all know that when you have code like this, that we need to write tests for this part. And one popular way to get test coverage for those error lines is by writing a custom mock for it in your unit tests. So if we can't trust real systems for error conditions, why isn't it sufficient to simply trust that your unit tests cover your error conditions and your integration tests make sure things work in a more realistic scenario? Uh, for those of you who don't recognize it, this is the mock turtle from Alice in Wonderland. As you can see, he's not quite the same as a real turtle, just like your test mocks aren't quite the same as a real system. There's a reason that the mock turtle is crying. He knows he can't quite do the things a real turtle can do, just like your test mocks can't quite replace those real systems. Let's take a look at a simple example from OpenStack Compute. Uh, in June of this year, OpenStack Compute introduced a bug making it impossible to revoke a certificate. These lines of code at fault here uh, are these two additions. This is not a criticism of Nova. The bug has already been fixed. My point is that they fell into a very common trap. The bug here is that Chadur does not actually return a value. Because the unit tests introduced the change, also introduced their own mocks for Chadur, Nova's unit tests properly cover all of the code, but the code is not integrated with a real system in a way that verified in any way what the real system did. Uh, in this case, the real system being Python's Chadur. Uh, in this specific case, uh, Nova might have simply tested against a real directory structure in the file system because relative to the value of testing against a real implementation, new folder is not a super expensive operation. However, standing up an OpenStack cloud is a little more work than running MakeDir. Uh, if you're developing an, developing an application against OpenStack, deploying a real cloud to test against can be expensive, error-prone, and slow, as Autoscale's experience has shown. Creating a one-off mock for every test is quick, but error-prone. Good mocks rapidly become a significant maintenance burden in their own right, as they're making sure that they validate all of their behavior against a real implementation. Uh, Autoscale needed something that could produce all possible behaviors like a test mock, but ensure those behaviors accurately reflected a production environment. It should be maintained as a, something maintained as a separate project, not part of the test suite, that can have its own tests and its own code review to ensure that its behavior is accurate. Since we've been proceeding from the general to the specific, right here, where we needed a realistic mock of a back-end OpenStack service is where the specific value of Mimic comes in. So the first version of Mimic 
was built as a stand-in for services such as identity, compute, and Rackspace Cloud load balancers, the services that Autoscale depends on. The essence of Mimic is pretending. So the first thing you must do to interact with it is to pretend to authenticate. Mimic does not validate credentials. All authentications will succeed. And as with a real identity endpoint, Mimic's identity endpoint returns a service catalog that contains all the endpoints for the services implemented within Mimic. So a well-behaved OpenStack client will use the service catalog to look up the URLs for the services that it wants to use. And such a client only needs two configuration val values to be able to communicate with cloud. One is the credentials, and the second one is the identity endpoint. So one such client would only have to change the identity endpoint to be that of Mimic to start using it. So also, when you ask Mimic to create a server, it pretends to create one. This is not like stubbing. It does not return static responses. When Mimic pretends to build a server, it remembers the information about that server and will tell you about it in the subsequent requests. Mimic was originally created to speed things up. So it was very important that it be fast, both to respond to requests as well as to help developers set, get set up fast. So it uses in-memory data structures with minimal software dependencies, almost entirely pure Python, no service dependencies, no configuration, and is entirely self-contained. So let's look at how we could use Mimic with the Nova command line client. So here's our config file that has all the environment variables requir required to run the Nova command line light client or any other OpenStack command line client. As you can see, we have set the username, password, and tenant to just be random values. And the auth URL is said to be that of the instance of Mimic that was running in our, from our previous demo. Now let's continue where we left off with our previous demo. So we already have an instance of Mimic running. We're going to pip install the Python Nova client. We're going to make sure that the config file has the URL set to that of Mimic. Source the config file and verify if there are any servers. Well, we didn't create any, so let's create one. We're just going to create one with a random flavor and image. So the server went into an active state immediately on creation. Let's see if this behavior is consistent. Let's create another server. So we created server two, and even this server went into an active state. And Mimic knows about both of these servers that were created, and both of them are in an active state. Now, we're going to delete the second server that we created. And now Mimic has only one of the servers. We did the same thing with Autoscale. We pointed all of our tests to run tests as well as the Autoscale API to run against an instance of Mimic. This reduced our test time exponentially. Before Mimic, the functional tests, the, API, the ones that validated the API contracts, would take 15 minutes to run. And after Mimic, it would take only 30 seconds to finish. And in the integration tests, if one of the servers remained in building state for 15 minutes longer than usual, then the test would take 15 longer to run and complete. These earlier would take three hours or more. And with Mimic, it takes less than three minutes and is consistent. All of our dev environments now are configured to run against Mimic. One of our devs from the Rackspace Cloud Intelligence team calls this developing on airplane mode, as we can work offline without having to worry about the uptimes up of the upstream systems and get immediate feedback on the code being written. But Leica, what about all the negative path testing stuff I was talking about before? Does Mimic simulate errors? How did this dev VM test autoscales error conditions? Well, Glyph, I am glad that you asked me that question. <laughs> <laughs> Mimic does simulate errors. Earlier when I said Mimic pretends to create a server, that wasn't entirely true. Mimic can also pretend to not create a server. It uses the metadata provided to it, inspects that metadata, and sets the state of the server respectively. So let's go back to that demo where we left off and see how this can be done. So we have the one server that we created. Now let's create a server with the metadata server building 30. This puts the server state in build state for 30 seconds. And Glyph will tell you how you could prolong it or not. And so we have two servers, one in the active state and build state. We can also create a server and have it go into an error state using the metadata server error true. 
So now you can see that we're able to create servers with three different states. For the purposes of order scale, it was important that we have the right number of servers on a scaling group. Even if the number of attempts to create one failed, we chose to use the metadata er error injection so that we could use the same test to run against real services as well as against Mimic. For order scale, the expected result is the same number of servers created irrespective of the number of failures. But this behavior may also apply to many other applications because retrying is a common logic for handling errors. However, the first implementation of Mimic had some flaws. It was fairly rack space specific. It only implemented services that autoscale depends on. And they were implemented as part of Mimic's core. And if you needed n endpoints, you needed to run it on n ports. And not just n ports, but n consecutive ports. It allowed for testing error scenarios, but only used the metadata method. And this was not supported by some clients that would probably not let their users enter metadata while creating a server. Also, Mimic was not implemented to be multi-region. It used global variables to store state, which meant that it was hard to add additional endpoints with different state in the same running Mimic instance. Mimic had an ambitious vision to be a one-stop mock for all OpenStack and Rackspace services that needed fast integration testing. However, its architecture at the time severely limited the ability of other teams to use it or to contribute to it. As Leica mentioned, it was specific not only to Rackspace, but to Autoscale. On balance, Mimic was also extremely simple. It followed the you aren't going to need it principle of extreme programming very well and implemented just the bare minimum to satisfy its requirements. There wasn't a whole lot of terrible code to throw out or much unnecessary complexity to eliminate. There is, however, a corollary to Yagni, which is eventually it turns out you are going to need it. Uh, so as Mimic grew, other services within Rackspace wanted to use th its functionality, and a couple of JSON responses and a couple of global dictionaries were not going to cut it anymore. So as one does, we created a plugin architecture. Uh, Mimic's identity endpoint is the top-level entry point to Mimic as a service. Every other URL to a mock is available from within the service catalog. As we were designing the plugin API, it was clear that this top-level identity endpoint uh, needed to be the core part of Mimic, and plugins would each add an entry for themselves to the service catalog. URLs within Mimic's service catalog all look similar. Uh, in order to prevent conflicts between plugins, Mimic's core encodes the name of your plugin and the region name specified by your plugin's endpoint. Here we can see what a URL for the compute mock looks like. This portion of the URL, which identifies the mock being referenced, is handled by Mimic itself, so it's always addressing the right plugin. Then there's the part of the URL that your plugin itself in it, uh, handles, which identifies the tenant and the endpoint within your API. Each plugin is uh, called an API mock, and that's an object that has only two methods, catalog entries and resource for region. And that's it. Catalog entries takes a tenant ID and returns the entries in Mimic's service catalog for that particular API mock. APIs have catalog entries for each API type, which in turn have endpoints for each virtual region that they represent. This takes the form of an iterable of a class called, simply enough, entry, each of which is a tenant ID, a type, a name, and a collection of endpoint objects, each containing the name of a pretend region that says ORD, because that's a Rackspace region, but it could say the moon, um, a URI version prefix that should appear in the service catalog after the generated service URL, but before the tenant ID, and of course the tenant ID itself uh, for each endpoint. Resource for region takes the name of a region, a URI prefix produced by Mimic Core to make uh, URIs for your services unique, so you can generate URLs uh, into your own service if you need to generate them as part of your responses, uh, and a session store where the API mock may look up uh, the state of the resources it's pretended to provision for this tenant before. It returns an HTTP resource associated with the top level of any given region. This resource then routes the request to any tenant-specific resources associated with the full URL path. Once you've created a resource for your region, it has a route for the parts of the URI that starts at the end of the Mimic uh, plugin URI path. And here you can see what the Nova list servers endpoint would look like using Mimic's API. As you can see, it's not a lo lot of work at all to return a return a canned response. Uh, it would be a little bit beyond the scope of this brief talk to go through a full tutorial, so if you haven't been following all of the code, uh, that's fine. You can always come by on GitHub later. Um, but uh, hopefully this slide, which is a fully working response, shows that it's pretty easy to get started. 
Um, and now that we have most of a plugin written, uh, hand wave, hand wave, let's uh, get Mimic to load it up. Uh, to register your plugin with Mimic, you just need to drop an instance of it into any module of the Mimic.plugins package. This is really a complete plugin registration. That's all there is to it. Um, this, of course, just shows you how to create ephemeral static responses. But as Leica said previously, Mimic doesn't just create fake responses. It remembers, in memory, what you've asked it to do. Uh, that session store object passed to resource for region is the place you can keep any relevant state. Uh, it gives you a per-tenant session object, which uh, you can then ask that session for any mock-specific data you want to store for that tenant. Uh, so all session data is created on demand, so you pass in a callable to go with your uh, API mock object, which will create your data if no data exists yet for that mock for that tenant. Note that you can pass other API mocks as well. So if you want to inspect a tenant session state for other services and factor that into your responses, for example, you have a service where you want to pretend that you're going to get a certain type of response if the tenant is over quota in their Nova mock, um, uh, it's easy to do this. The pattern for inspecting and manipulating a different mock's data can also be used to create control planes for your plugins so that one plugin can tell another how and when to fail by storing information about that future expected failure on its session. We're still working on our first error injection endpoint that works this way. It's still in a, a branch and a pull request. By having a second plugin tell the first what its failures are. Uh, but this is an aspect of Mimic's development that we're really excited about because that control plane API also doubles as a memory for all the unexpected and even potentially undocumented ways in which the mock service can fail. So anyone testing a product will run into unexpected errors. That's why we test. But we don't know what we don't know and can be prepared of prepared for it ahead of time, right? When we were running the test for autoscale against compute, we began to see some one-off errors. Like when provisioning a server, the test expected the server to go into a building state and remain there for some time, and then go into active. But it would remain in building for long, or indefinitely, or would go into an error state. And autoscale had to handle such errors. And we changed our code to be able to do that. And Mimic provided a way to test these consistently. However, like I said, we don't know what we don't know. We were not anticipating to find any more such errors. But there were more. And this was a slow process for us to uncover such errors as we tested against the real services. And we continue to add these errors to Mimic. Now, wouldn't it be great if not every client that depended on a service that had to go had to go through the same cycle. Not everyone had to find all the possible error conditions in a service by experience and have to deal with them at the pace that they occur. What if we had a repository for all such known errors and everyone contributes to it? So the next person using the plugin can use the existing ones and ensure that their application behaves consistently irrespective of the errors and be able to add any new ones to it. Mimic is just that. It is a repository of all known responses, including error responses. And it has an endpoint called presets that add today lists all the metadata-related error conditions that can be simulated using Mimic. In addition to storing a repository of errors, Mimic allows for finer control of behavior beyond success and error. You could determine the behavior of a Mimic service in some detail. We're not just here today to talk about exactly what Mimic offers right now. Uh, but also where we'd like it to go. And in that spirit, I'll discuss one feature that Mimic has for controlling behavior today and a couple which we'd like to have in the future. Appropriately enough, since I'm talking about things now and things in the future, the behavior control I'd like to talk about that Mimic has right now is the ability to control time. That is to say, when you, you do something against Mimic that will take some time, such as building a server, time does, act does not actually pass for the purposes of that operation. Instead of simply waiting 10 seconds, you can hit the out-of-band tick endpoint, like so. It will tell you that time has passed, like so. Uh, now, you may notice there's something a little funny about that timestamp. It's suspiciously close to uh, January 1st, midnight, 1970. Uh, Mimic begins each subsequent restart, thinking it is the beginning of time. Uh, that is to say, 1970, January 1st, uh, at the Unix epoch. And if you want to advance the clock, you just plug in the number of seconds since the epoch is the amount in your uh, first tick request, and Mimic will appear to catch up to real time instantly. If you've previously created a server with the server building metadata that tells it to build for some number of seconds, and you hit the tick endpoint with that number of seconds, 
that server and any others that are in that state will now show up as active as they should. This means you can set up very long timeouts, have servers behave realistically, have things happen at the same time, which is often hard in integration testing, um, but in a way where you can test several hours of timeouts in a second if you need to. Uh, if you have legacy integration tests that need to run in real time and have time.sleep in your test suite, you should fix that and ignore this slide, but if you can't do that right now, you can ask Mimic to pay attention to the real clock with the dash dash real time command line option, which disables the time advancing endpoint. Another feature that is, that is not implemented yet, but we hope to design later, is, as we've spoken about, the ability to inject errors ahead of time using a separate control plane, which is not part of a mock's endpoint. We've begun work on a branch doing this for compute, but we feel like every service should have the ability to inject arbitrary errors. Uh, as Leica explained, Mimic can already inject some errors by supplying metadata within a request itself. But this means that in order to cause an error to happen, you need to modify the request that you're making to Mimic, and it's not exactly the same as the request that you would want to make against a production system. So your application isn't entirely unmodified. What we'd like to do in the future is to put the error injection control plane into the service catalog with a special entry type that your testing infrastructure can talk to and your application can ignore. Uh, that way, your testing tool would authenticate to Mimic, tell Mimic to cause certain upcoming requests to succeed or fail before the system that you're testing has even talked to Mimic in the first place. Your system would not need to relay any expected failure data itself. It could use naming conventions. It could use other sorts of out-of-band out information uh, to match that request to an expected failure, and so no metadata would need to be passed through. Uh, what we'd really like to build with these out-of-band failures, though, is not just a single feature, but an API that allows people developing applications against OpenStack to make those applications as robust as possible by easily determining how they will react at scale, under load, and under stress, even if they've never experienced those error conditions uh, in a real test environment. Uh, so we need you to contribute the errors and behaviors you've experienced. Mimic is also based on a networking framework that some of you might know about, which has features such as a built-in DNS and SSH server. Uh, it would be really cool if when a virtual server was booted, it, the advertised SSH port, which currently doesn't respond, did give you access to an SSH server, albeit one that cheaply created local shells or just a container or something instead of a, a provisioned virtual machine. Similarly, if we had a designate mock, it could be really cool to have real DNS entries so that you could point your, D your DNS at localhost. So Mimic can be that tool where you do not have to stand up the entire open stack to understand how OpenStack APIs behave or to just play with it. Mimic can be the tool which enables an OpenStack developer to get quick feedback on the code he or she is writing and not have to go through the gate multiple times to understand that upstream failures can happen once in a way. One of the things I like to point out to potential new contributors is that Mimic isn't really real software. It's tiny, it's self-contained, it doesn't need to interact with a database or any external services, and uh, since it mi mimics exclusively existing APIs, there are very few high-level design decisions. As a result, Mimic is a really easy project to contribute to. If you're looking to cut your teeth on something OpenStack related, Mimic is a great place to get started. So please come join us, build Mimic. Together we can make it a, an error repository or a repository for all known responses. As we mentioned earlier, Mimic is open source. There's the GitHub URL to it. We're maintaining all of our issues that are in progress or are in plans for works in the Issues tab. You can also chat with us on Pound Pound Mimic. You can start by using Mimic, giving us your feedback, or better yet, start contributing to it by adding plugins to services that do not exist today. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so if anybody has any questions, I think there's mics in the middle of the room. How do you track consistency between a real API and a Mimic API? The question was, how do you track consistency between real APIs and Mimic APIs? Um, there's a quote, uh, one of my authors, uh, my favorite authors has this quote, uh, strength of will and faith in our holy cause. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, uh, we, We've tested Mimic again. So Mimic is currently still part of the gate for uh, the Rackspace Autoscale product. And that means that we validate this on a pretty regular basis just through that usage. And really, that's because we want to be able to mock unusual errors that come back that are unexpected, that might only exist in certain versions. That sort of validation is probably going to be a fairly informal process going forward. But the goal is to get Mimic into more and more kind of gating project processes where it is compared against real OpenStack on a regular basis. Um, so it's manual, but 
it's distributed, uh, well, we hope, across multiple teams. Yes. One team is doing it all right now. Also, we have 100% test coverage on our unit tests, but the idea is that we probably should have tests that run like whatever responses that we get from Mimic and validate that against real services too, so we know that both of them are in line. And With the use Died. of the meta tag to inject failures. Um, so, so let's say I'm writing my production code. So I need to change my production code to use Mimic for testing. Is that how it will work, or like how do I inject failures without changing my production code? Because, well, because so it doesn't really serve the purpose, right? Yeah. So the the question is, how do I inject failures without changing my production code? So with the Autoscale product, we didn't actually change Autoscale itself. Autoscale would just take a, some parameters for how to create a server, and we would relay those along. Uh, similarly, load balancers have a, have a similar facility. So if you have a product where you can pass metadata through, then you don't need to modify your code. Uh, and if you have a product where you can't specify metadata, we're totally working on that. We think that's a really important use case. Okay. Thank you. Does, oh. Uh, the question is, isn't it more appropriate to call tests run against Mimic unit tests than integration tests, because Mimic is not a real system? Um, that is, uh, I, I think that there's probably a right answer to that question, but I think exploring that is a deep philosophical discussion about test <laughs> terminology. Mimic is in a, a middle place between Unit and integration test. Because you would want to like not sign off by testing it only against Mimic, but you would want to test against all your dependent systems so that you know your application is working fine against them before you put it out in the real world and test it against real services itself. Yeah, so, so Mimic definitely is uh, not supposed to replace your integration tests. You still need to run your integration tests, but the goal is that what Mimic should be able to help you with is making it so that by the time you get to your integration gate, it's always passing already because you got really rapid feedback yeah. earlier in the cycle. Um, so it's sort of unit testy, it's sort of regression testy, it's sort of acceptance testy, it's sort of functional testy. There's, there's a whole bunch of different yeah. test, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I'm sorry, in the back there? Um, is there ongoing work with the Neutron API? With the, which API? The Neutron. Neutron. Neutron API? Um, not currently, but we could definitely start working on it. We're looking for what plugins that could be of most use for people so that we can start using. How many APIs do we mock? Uh, so we, we mock very few right now. The, the main goal of this talk is really to get folks to start contributing to it. We've got um, compute, we've got identity. Uh, these are partial mocks. Um, yeah. Do you have any idea how much percentage of compute we mock at this point? About like 30% maybe? So That's yeah, so we're, we're trying to make it more complete. We mocked exactly as much as we've needed so far. So. Yeah. So yeah, I think Swagger is a, a tool, any, if any tool like that gets like officially adopted and, and stamped by the op OpenStack API committees, that yes, we would definitely yeah, like to have that. We would love to do that too. Yeah. Um, Uh, so have we ever thought about generating Mimic's responses from uh, API discovery features rather than manually doing everything? Um, yes, we've definitely looked at that a little bit. The problem is some of the things we want to be able to mock are outside the formally defined API. Like, for example, network connections that hang is one of the things that we have uh, 
on our list of features to, to add, and there's nothing in the API specifications or the discovery features that says sometimes your sockets don't work. And, but that's an important failure mode that a lot of clients don't handle very well. Any other questions? Cool. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>